Welcome to Pros and Cons, a podcast by writers for writers, brought to you by Precipice Fiction. Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dorad nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. I write to find strength. I write to become the person that hides inside me. I write to light the way through the darkness for others. I write to be seen and heard. I write to be near those I love. I write by accident, promptings, purposefully, and anywhere there is paper. I write because my heart speaks a different language that someone needs to hear. I write past the embarrassment of exposure. I write myself out of nightmares. I write because I am nostalgic, romantic, and the man happy endings. I write to make sense of the senseless. I write knowing I will be killed by my own words, stabbed by critics, crucified by both misunderstanding and understanding. I write for the haters, the lovers, the lonely, the brokenhearted, and the dreamers. I write because one day someone will tell me that my emotions were not a waste of time. I write because one day I will be gone, but what I believed and felt will live on. That is a quote by Shannon L. Alder on why she writes, and that is exactly the subject of our podcast today. Hello, this is the Pros and Cons podcast, or sometimes we feel like pros and sometimes we feel like cons. And today I'm joined by um, Paddy Boylan. Hello. And uh, Ali Burnham. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> oh, hang on, hang on. I'll Alex, change. his name is I'll Alex. My... No, I'll, I'll change my thing. So, yeah, rem- remember to change that at the end. Uh, well, Did you no, forget Alex's change. name? No, no I, I always I always read the names though because oh, I, okay. I, I can't think and speak yeah. at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's why you're right. <laughs> I'm like your man from a. Uh, I'm like Anchorman. <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ron Need a teleprompter. Yeah. 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 Uh, All right, and I am your host James Healy. And before we jump into the topic today, I just want to ask, what are you guys reading at the moment? I'll start with you, Alex um yeah i'm going through i started uh one i can't remember the name of the the uh, writer she's she's quite a new writer i think i'm I'm gonna butcher her name um but the the name of the book is uh lin hung and it's about basically Hmm. a neighborhood where um there are all these houses for sale well there are all these houses and in the houses you can see your passed on relatives so consequently there's like basically people camp out in this neighborhood waiting for one of these houses to come up so they can move in and they can commune with uh, with their their deceased loved ones i'm reading that and i've only started cool. but it's really good that's a really interesting premise it seems like every yes, time you cool. you you say what you're reading it's something different do you like finish a book a week alex or no i just read a bunch of stuff at the same time <laughs> right okay um no i've been reading witches of east week for a while i'm actually still reading that but yeah cool and patty what are you reading at the moment i'm at the very very tail end of wolf hall uh, rather the mirror and the light which is the third book of wolf hall which is hillary mantel's Really, really Brilliant. good Brilliant. series yeah and uh at alex's recommendation i'm playing through the game prey which mm. was a commercial flop. I don't know why. It's effing brilliant. And if you happen to see this within three days, it's on ten dollars on Steam at the moment. So um, really good. Yeah, yeah. Game. N- not not much else yeah. new in the uh, writing front. Slowly getting through the Wolf Hall trilogy. Nice, nice. Um, I was just reading Act of Oblivion by Robert Harris, um, who's the historical writer who I keep butchering his name every time to bring him up <laughs> just um, call him r harris and you'll come yeah, r. Harris. Um, yeah. mr harris um, yeah. this one was about the largest manhunt in history uh, which is ah. following the overthrow overthrowing of a king of england and they um beheaded him and then a few years later the monarchy was reinstated and everyone who was involved in the kind of overthrowing and the judging and the execution mm was hunted down over the course of probably five or 10 years and hung, drawn and quartered. But uh, these two guys evaded it for many, many years and escaped to America. And it's about the uh, kind of manhunts that people went over to America to like track them down and stuff. Really, really good. Um, Really quite frightening. Like they go into like a lot of detail on what being hung, drawn and quartered actually consisted of. Yeah. So yeah. the idea of sitting and waiting for that execution to take place was quite awful. 
um, but also the living conditions of the guys that were in hiding were quite a uh, quite brutal, and they were kind of waiting to see if there'd be a change in the po political climate and see if things would get better. But it it wasn't, and there was kind of political reasons why people were trying to hunt them down, and manhunts were being sent out, and assassins were sent out, and stuff like this. So really, really good read. The Wolf Hall trilogy. Uh, as well is kind of teaching me that just if if there's a monarch in power, just just don't work anywhere near them. Don't work for them. Don't work for anyone that works for them. Like it seems that, and yeah, like historical fiction is definitely going to focus on the more interesting and brutal moments in history. But it just seems like the capacity for dying a really horrible, tortuous death is a little too likely anywhere near monarchy. Wow. Yeah. Steer clear. <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right, so uh, jumping into the topic today, it's going to be a little bit more of a personal one, because um, after all, writing is kind of a personal endeavor. Um, mm -hmm. So we're just going to go around to the group and kind of ask you guys some questions about your writing and where does it come from and why do you mm -hmm. do it and what do you hope to achieve out of it? So um, I guess the first question I'm going to start is at the beginning and ask um, what drew you to writing? Where did your writing start? Um, why did you start? Um, Paddy? Man, <laughs> really wishing I'd prepped some notes in advance. I uh, I was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I started in primary school and I had a primary school teacher that said, you're a good writer. And I entered a competition and I got to the finals and I kept writing and I kept having peers and teachers telling me that I was pretty good at it. And then I put it down for years and only ran Dungeons and Dragons games, which as it turns out was writing in another form. So I'd been writing these stories for my friends to play in because I was the perpetual dungeon master. It's like the person that runs the game. Uh, and then years later, when it comes, like when I decide, oh, I'm actually going to, you know, try taking up writing for real. It turns out I've got years and years of practice without really realizing it. And it, it came pretty naturally. If, if I hadn't had, though, like some really, really good teachers in my early years that were encouraging me to put my writing forward and keep practicing, I, I don't. I don't think I would have ever come to this point. And I wonder how many people out there are actually really talented and just have never been pushed to pursue it and will never know that. Yeah, yeah that's kind of me in a nutshell. Okay. And how about yourself, Alex? Um, I started writing. Writing is, aside from like making little toys and things when I was a kid, like little paper things, like writing is really the first creative act i recall doing I, I distinctly remember writing some sort of little like sci-fi story about someone on some kind of like there was a space station or there was some sort of like super bike or something and i remember writing the whole thing out and being like this is great and then not saving it and getting deleted and being really bummed out about that and being like so um i've always been paranoid about saving my writing ever since but yeah i i did that and then i sort of somehow i like fell into i remember uh d really liking writing essays in um in english so i sort of fell into writing music criticism and i did that for a really long time and i wrote for a number of like publications and uh, i started getting tickets to festivals and things and did a bit of that which was really fun um doing reviews and stuff and then at some point i think that petered out and i just discovered like playing music um, and I didn't do writing for a long time. And then I, there, there are a few things that happened. I met Matan, um, who was at the, one of the schools that I was, was working at, at the time. And he was, was like, I'm, I'm a writer. And I'm like, that's cool. I've never met a real writer before. And so that was fun. Uh, but then also actually near to that school, I very distinctly remember picking up, um, Skeleton Crew by Stephen King and going through it and being like, this is fantastic. Like these stories are so bloody engaging um, and just being like, man, I would really like to do that. And I think at that time, my the, my interest in playing professionally music in a band was sort of waning and I, I've always needed to do something creative. So that sort of went up on the rise with that. And um, yeah, now here I am. And I just, I just try and write every day. Cool. And James, are you, you going to? Yeah, I guess I have to kind of get involved. Yeah, we have to turn the question back <laughs> to you at the end of well, everyone, of course. <laughs> yeah, you do. You do. Uh, I'm in it as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I probably was always telling stories from like quite a young age. Um, I used to like make up stories and then like tell them to my sister when we were younger. Huh. Um, cool. Yeah. I think it was probably a form of 
escapism and distraction. Um, and then I think when I got older, probably around the time that I was leaving school, there was just a lot of like stress and a lot of hectic stuff going on. Um, I just started picking up copy books and just writing, just filling the page up with like writing. And I obviously had no idea what I was doing. And I was just churning out nonsense into these copy books instead of like studying for exams and like doing my homework and stuff like that. Um, I'd be sitting in class, just writing stories, writing stories, writing stories, um, and then doing the same thing when I was at home. And then it was a uh, probably kind of in my late teens, friends and stuff were encouraging me to go and do writing courses, which I was always really resistant of doing because I enjoyed the process of writing, and I felt like if I started learning too much craft, I started actually taking it seriously, I wouldn't enjoy enjoy yeah. it anymore. Yeah. Um, which like, happened to a degree. I find that I I don't find films or books well, i love books but i don't find films as engaging anymore because i know so much about plot and stuff that i'm so so much more critical of it now um but going and actually kind of learning the craft and starting to figure it out um was so beneficial because i would have just kept writing nonsense <laughs> that just made no sense yeah just the process of trying to write it's obviously like you learn the craft and then you try to write free form in a process that still like makes sense and follows the craft and stuff. So it's just a, a more engaging process that way. So you mentioned like being resistant to learning structured writing and learning like the, the theory of writing and stuff. I've recently started taking up like a Saturday class. I'm teaching, I'm teaching 15 year old kids writing and it's really rewarding, really great. The theory of the school or how they operate is they don't want to teach formal writing or grammar or how to structure a sentence because it kills enjoyment. Um, yeah. I haven't read the research but they, that they point to, but they point to a whole bunch of academic research that says when you teach kids things like this is how to structure a sentence. This is, you always need a noun, you always need a subject. And uh, it makes kids think like, writing isn't a fun activity writing is like a chore writing something you need yeah. to do whereas mm. if you just write and just like encourage just free form writing that's that's how to build the love of it mm. totally makes sense to me it's how you learn yeah. a language too like you don't mm. when children learn languages they don't you don't sit them down and go this is a participle and this is a verb and this is like a you know whatever uh they just they speak it and they do it and they learn from osmosis and like they say oh i i I done, you know, they say like, I gone, I go on to the toilet and, and then the parent might be like, Oh, you went to the toilet. And they're like, I went to the, you know, like they, yeah, they like learn through that, yeah. that process of uh, just picking it up naturally, I suppose. That yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. That was that kind of thing that like killed the enjoyment of drawing for me. I used to draw a lot as a kid and paint. And then I went to school and I took art and they were Same. like, this is how you shade. Now yeah. we're going to draw bowls of fruit for yeah. six weeks <laughs> i was like fuck this i can't stand this <laughs> i think so I, I think there's it. also sorry i think there's also something to be because i like i really like learning the technical aspects of doing things but i have to be drawn to want to learn them for my own sake i yeah. certainly can't be made to learn them so when you're yeah. ready to to go and learn like well how does the three act structure work and you know why is that important and um how do I build characterization? And there are specific tools for that. And you seek those out and you want to learn them. I'm a pretty self, like I'm a pretty autonomous learner. So I'll go and look for those and I'll figure them out myself. But uh, if someone tries to teach me something that I don't care about, I'll be like, well, this isn't really relevant to me right now. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like if you learn it as an answer to a question that you were asking, hmm. it seems like it makes so much more sense. Whereas if it's given to you as a tool, it feels like, oh, this is something I have to learn how to use now. You know what I mean? Totally. Because like mm. you, you come across the problem in a story where you're like, oh, okay, the plot works, the character works, but why is the team falling short? And then you yeah. go off and you learn about, you know, how to develop a team throughout a story and the thematic argument, things like that. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, Eureka, that's what the story is missing. And yeah, maybe I can fix this story, but at the very least I can start the next story with that in mind yeah. and work yeah, it through yeah. it. So and do you think that, that you think that every author as like a result of that would write because they really love writing and they wake up every morning and think, Oh boy, I can't wait to write. I'm, I'm reading a lot of quotes in, in like prep for this episode and a lot of writers. And I, to an extent agree. Say like, no writing, writing is suffering. Writing is difficult. 
it's a chore. Writing a book is like extruding yourself through a toothpaste sized mm. aperture. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I see, I love the finished product and I'm really proud of everything I've written, but writing itself isn't always, isn't always fun. It can be a yeah. lot of hard work and it can be really laborious. Do you guys feel yeah. the same? Yeah, definitely. I feel like writing, writing a short story can be really fun, but if you're sitting down to like do a 80,000 word project, um, the fun, the fun that drew you to it in the first place wanes at a certain yeah. point. Yeah. And you know, if you're going to finish it, you have to push through and you have to regenerate that fun. And then you look back on what you've written and you're like, this is crap. There's so <laughs> much work. There's so much work left to be done. This is garbage. Yeah. Um, and it just becomes a slog. Like I've started Scavenger's Tread probably last year with the intention of like, finish this in a year. Don't take it too seriously. It's a first novel. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to approach the finished first draft of the half point. And I'm like, what am I doing to myself? It's crushing. Um, I don't know yeah, how it, to it not. It's a process. You have to stick with it. Yeah. I don't know how to not take writing seriously. That sounds impossible. Yeah. Even if you say at the beginning, I'm not going to do it. Inevitably, you get drawn into the writing <laughs> and you have to perfect it. And yeah, yeah, it has, to be, it has to be the best it. version of what it could of be. Yeah, it yeah, must be. I, I kind of compare it to like jogging. Like, um, I don't know if you guys have done a lot of running. I know you have, Patty, and I imagine yeah, you because yeah. you've trained a lot. So um, it's it's sort of like when you start out, like you've got a lot of energy and you're like, oh yeah, this is great. I can go for ages. And then and you slowly begin to fatigue and there becomes mm. a point where you're like, this is really difficult. Yeah, this I, sucks. I am I am out of energy. I'm out of breath. Uh, I you know don't know what I'm doing. But inevitably at some point you get this second win. And at that point, then you get it spurred on. And that can be caused by mm. a bunch of different things. Usually for me, it's like, oh, I just found a plot bit that, that is fun. And I, I'm like, oh, this I'm going to go off in this direction now. Um, but you can you can be writing like 8,000 words to get to that next little bit there. And if you don't know where you're going, and as someone who is not a plotter, I rarely have any more than a, than a sketchy idea of what's happening. Uh, it can be a real struggle. Having said that, there is a lot of times uh, when I think writing can be blissful and you can just, I wrote a short story recently that I did it in two, in, in two like jumps, two jags over two days. I did one, like three, I think maybe 2,500 words one day. And then the next day I finished it off with like another thousand. And like, that was just bliss. That was so much fun. And I think it's one of the better things I've written. Um, but yeah, that's, then there's another three short stories that I've sort of half completed and been like, eh, no, I don't really want to. So um, it's, it's tough. Uh, yeah. And I don't know whether that's necessarily just me not efforting it enough and being like, oh, well, you know, this is, this is not worth continuing. So I won't bother. Or if it's just that it really wasn't that good material to begin with. And I maybe should have just jumped onto something else sooner. Huh? Come, come back to it in a few months. That's the thing to yeah, do, right? Yeah. You put yeah. something down, you come back and then you've got more perspective um, a little down the line. Yeah. We're kind of just circling around my next question. So I'm just going to ask it to keep us on track a little yeah. bit. Um, why do you think you keep it up writing? Why do you think you're still writing? Um, I write because I need a creative outlet. I, if I don't, I I almost get physically not right, like a, a little ill. Like I just I get really in my head and I get kind of anxious and stressed. Huh. Um, and I can do that with music or I can do it in writing. So yeah again exercise it comes back to that thing it's like i have to exert this muscle or it will cause me pain that's kind of it but i wouldn't say that i have that sense of like this is a story that needs to be told the world needs to hear this thing i have to say which i think actually makes it easier for me because i just i approach it fairly mechanically from this like well i need to do this this needs to be done so that i feel better about myself or just in general um, and I don't know, maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe that, that like lends itself to lower quality, but it certainly makes it easier to just write. That's, that's one sort of thing. So I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's a personal thing that is in, endemic to me, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that would be my answer. Hmm. I, I write because I want to be an author. I really want to be an author. Like when I think of maybe the three coolest things that you could be, it's like rock star. Author, I was say rock star. <laughs> like CEO who spends all his time on a yacht 
wearing <laughs> Crocs with like a martini in his hand, speaking on like a big 80s style mobile telephone with like the yep. long antenna. <laughs> like, just, but like, it's so cool. Like to be able to be at a party and people say, what do you do? And you say, I'm an author and not be bullshitting. And you've actually just been working on like this one book your whole life that you've never released. Like that would be the coolest thing in the world to me, to be able to make a living by translating your ideas into products that people actually want to buy. Like what an ego yeah. trip. Uh, yeah. yeah I, I can't think of anything cooler. And I'm aware that there are a lot more people that want to be writers and that try to be published authors than there are published authors. So yeah. I think for anyone, it's kind of a long shot, but fuck it. You know, why, why not try? Right. I mean, yeah. I, but isn't that, that's, that's kind of the reason for every writer, right? Because writing is like a really cool thing. If you can make it a, a living for you guys. Um. Yeah. Well, my thinking is that like, for me, I just, I will always write. Like it's always just there. Mm -hmm. It's always just something that I'm pulled towards doing or I'm drawn towards doing or I often have to do. So I look at it and I say, like, I ha like it would just make sense to try and make a living doing this because I'm going to do it for the rest of my life anyway. Yeah. And if I can make some money out of it, then I can actually just spend more time doing this thing that I love and less time doing shitty jobs that I hate. So <laughs> it just, mm. just makes sense. Um, I, I don't feel that. To pursue that goal. I don't feel that being compelled to write thing. Like, I love it and I think I'm pretty good at it. But... Yeah, whenever I hear people saying, like, I I have to write, it's like breathing, I always feel like, well, shit, is there something wrong with me? Like, should I even be trying to pursue writing if I don't feel that? And, like, well, I, no, the I think, more I logical everyone... part of me thinks no, but... No, I mean, it, people yeah. have different motivations for what they're doing. Like, for, for me, recently, I just, um, I've had a little bit of a, um, a reshift in priorities in terms of how I'm thinking of my career and my life, because I've been running guitar schools my whole life, but... Um, I, this, is, this is a bit of a drawn out way to do it, but I, it is something I want to talk about because I think it's part of the why. Um, so I've been doing that for a long time. I've run guitar schools and I did, I did it by myself initially and I did pretty well at that, but I sort of got a little bit of professional loneliness and stopped. And then I started working for someone else and that's recently petered out to a point where I can't do that anymore um, just because of the way it was run and sort of stuff. And I've started doing that again, started doing it for myself. And I have this huge backlog of like ability of, of stuff to do. So I'm like, oh, I can do this. And now it's really fun to run a business. It's like really, really fun. It's like, it's like a guitar school simulator video game. That's how it feels to me <laughs> right now, which is really exciting. And I'm, I thought like, well, I can actually make quite a lot of money from this, but the 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 knock-on effect from that is that well what do you want to write you, do you want to write things that are really good or do you want to write for a living and i'm like well ideally both but if i had to pick ideally one of those both. things i want to write things that are really good and if i want to write things that are really good i may have to spend a long long time writing them the each individual thing so if i can do something that i enjoy and have that pay my bills at least in the short term um, and, and enjoy doing that and then be able to write and be able to spend a, like an inordinate amount of time or energy writing something and making it really good and then putting that out, whether or not that makes a lot of money or not much money, it's, it's sort of immaterial because it's like I've produced something of very high quality. So I don't have to worry about the economic financial concerns of that. Um, does that make sense? I, I know it sort of seems at odds with the thing I said before about like, ah, it doesn't matter if it's good because... I'm, I just have to do it anyway, but it's, it's sort of a perspective and mind shift that has really taken off a lot of pressure. Cause it's like, I can take as long as I need to do this mm. because I'm doing this other thing that I can do as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you, you're kind of saying, you said like an either or with making it really good or with, with making career out of writing. Are you talking about like, I can either write something that's really creatively fulfilling to me that I know is great, or I can be like a genre writer who's writing to Amazon keywords and is creating the most yeah. marketable product. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And and more to that side of it, it's like, I would have to write a lot of things very quickly to be able to, from mm -hmm. the research I've seen, unless you're a unicorn, like, you know, Patrick Roch Rothfuss or, or Stephen King, um, you it's unlikely that you'll be able to for quite a long time um, make a lot of money putting out uh, like, like putting out things infrequently. Like uh, the, the, the Australian author, um, he did Barracuda and he also did the slap. Uh, 
Uh, oh, uh, Nick. He's got a Greek name Nick, anyway. He starts with yeah, a T, the surname. But anyway, that guy. He just recently, after like 20 years of writing, is like, I, I no longer have a day job now. I don't have to work as a veterinary assistant. Like after 20 years of being a very prestigious Australian writer, he's now just gotten to that point. So it's like, if that guy is taking that long to go the literary route and, and do that and releasing things fairly slowly, it might take a while. Mm, so, depressing. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, but it's like, you can kind of be like, well, I'm going to put all my eggs in this basket and like pray that I win the lottery or I can do something else as well. I, I don't know if that... Yeah, I, I'm not sure if that comes across as uh, as bleak, but I don't know. I find it kind of hopeful that it's like I have all the time I, in the world I need to make something of exceptional um, quality. James, why do you continue to write? Um, yeah, I, I'm. I think I might be on the opposite end of things. If, if to, to, since the two of you kind of don't feel that like compelling urge or that like need to do it, like um. I was thinking beforehand, is there any cool way of saying this? <laughs> like some clever intellectual way of saying this, but I think it just fundamentally comes down to like, um, I kind of write it to like process my emotions and sometimes often to distance myself from my emotions as well. Um, if I'm right, if like I'm sitting down and editing something, it's usually just a distraction. Or um, if I'm writing something free, like free form, um, that's usually based on like what I'm feeling at the time. Um, and there was a line in that quote I read out earlier by um, Shannon, which said, I write so that my some of my, my emotions are not a waste of time. And I think I like I really resonate with that because you can spend a lot of time maybe sitting by yourself yeah. with your fields. Sure. And it just feels like time, like empty time that you've just spent with that. And I think if you can sit down and even just write a few lines or construct a story based around what's going on or around those emotions it feels like at least you've put you've got something constructive out of it or something yeah. positive that maybe other yeah. people can pick this story up and read that and be entertained or have a sense of empathy or catharsis from reading that story then it feels like at least this wasn't just empty time that was spent mm. no. shit. So, uh, yes, yeah, I, that, that could be a big part of it and there is something really centering about it and I, I think back to those times when I've had the privilege of being able to write, write like eight hours a day. And that was actually really cool. Structuring your life around something that you're creating that comes entirely from your own creativity and, and your own intelligence is so incredibly satisfying. And knowing that yeah. when you come home, well, from like whatever, what, what when you are going to go to your quote unquote job, it's, it's actually something that you've started and that you're entirely directing. That, that's mm. a pretty amazing feeling was when you're writing, you are in charge of the entire thing. Like you're not at anyone yeah. else's whims. Yeah. That feels great. That, that feels really, really good. Man, to be able to do that as a living, I, yeah, that's the dream. That is absolutely the dream. Yeah. It'd be pretty incredible. Um, yeah. That is definitely what like, like is pushing me now at the moment to kind of get through scavengers tread and to try to pick up the next one afterwards as quickly as possible. Cause that's try to get, two or three books finished over the next few years mm. and start handing out the publishers. Um, yeah. So yeah, pretty, pretty motivated to get on that. Yeah. Um, I've heard recently, I got some really good advice from like a veteran New Zealand writer. He was the guy that wrote, um, you guys know the whale writer? It was a film that came out. Oh, they got oh, the film. Oh, okay. I didn't know that was a book. Yeah. Yeah. There's that been a few uh, yeah. F- yeah, films that came from this guy's books. And I was at a workshop and he was speaking and he said, one of the most important things is actually setting a schedule knowing when you're going to have each milestone done. And that probably sounds really obvious to a lot of people, but for some reason it never occurred to me. I'm like, oh, it's going to mm. take what it takes. And he said, if you do that, it's going to expand out into infinity and you may not get it done. But as soon as you put a deadline on it. Parkinson's law, yeah. What's Parkinson's law? Parkinson's? I think it's, I, I could be, I could be misquoting this, but I think Parkinson's law, it might be something else, is... uh time expands or work expands to fill uh-huh. the time allotted to it so yeah. if you give it oh. infinite time it is theoretically infinite work but if you put a cap on it uh, then you have to meet that quota and yeah. be more productive you know? that sounds like exactly what what this guy was talking about 
yeah, I, I need to internalize that more and do it more myself. Mm, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, because I, I mean, I certainly have a time to sit down. There's that classic, oh, well, you know, you got to have a time. You, you got to make time to write, otherwise you won't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do that. I'm quite good at that. It's just going, hey, you have to, even if I take off a day or two, like at some point, the, the school mom in me will be like, Alex, you haven't been writing for a little while. You should sit down this morning and do some writing. And I'll be like, yes, internal mother. Um, <laughs> but in terms of like setting that physical goal in terms of, okay, I want to be either a milestone or a, or a word count um, sort of goal by a certain time. That's really, that's really powerful, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think James like I I wouldn't say that I am not I am not compelled to write because I am compelled to write. Um I just I'm coming more to realize that writing is the vocation that I'm cho- the creative vocation that I'm choosing. There's it's possible that that could be funneled into something else like music was was it for a long time, but I'm making a deliberate choice to be like if there is some um creative exertion that needs to be done by me, it will be writing. I will do that. And sometimes it's not super fun. And sometimes it's incredibly fun and rewarding, but um, that is what I've chosen. And that is what I'm, I'm going to do. So when I need, need to do the creative, it, that's, you know, that's what's going to come across. Um, and maybe that will change in, in, in the future. I hope not because then I have to learn a whole new skill set. but um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I certainly, certainly am enjoying doing that. Nice. Um, so I guess my next question is like, what inspires you? Like rather than yeah. the act of writing, like what is it that inspires you to write about? What are the things that you, uh, what is it that gets, and I know that there's also an element of like the discipline that you have to kind of sit down and create your own inspiration but in terms of like topics, in terms of like, what do you want to say? What are you trying to write? Like, what is it that uh, inspires both of you? Um, I get inspired by honestly, like, places or landscapes and i don't mean like oh finland looks cool i want to write something set there i mean like a specific instance or a like like a well no i mean i guess maybe maybe on a micro level like one story i wrote was about a guy at a gas station and i was like it'd be really cool to do something set at an arizona gas station where the, mm. the, the you know the there's a lot of desert i've written a lot of things in deserts actually i really 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 like that um that's one of the things that inspires me though like going like hey this is i i want to write something that's set here or on a space station as well as one that keeps coming up in in my mind or um i don't know something with big robots i'd like to write about that one day um i'm actually going through evangelion again right now which is uh inc- it's just the it's the juiciest anime and i'm like well that's that's gonna be hard to match but you know you need to but write yeah. your big robot story you've been talking about this for a while yeah, I'll when is the big robot, robot story, story coming? Something. I don't know. I can't you even remember to. what it's about. It's, you need I, to exercise that demon I, from yourself. I, I will. Yeah, I will do that at some point, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> so yeah. it'll, it'll just depend when it happens, but it will. A big robot it'll come up. Is that one of those stories that's kind of like in there as a seed and it's like yeah. ready to grow? Yeah. 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 It, one day, one day it'll it'll get there, but uh, I still have to work through my, I'm actually coming out the other side of my like Lovecraftian phase, I think. Um, but that was that's been a very pernicious thing for a long time. It's like there are forces greater than our control. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm gonna shut up. Uh, Patty, how about yourself? Other authors, other authors, and the way they've made me feel. One of mm. the first real, one of the first really good authors I got into. You know, besides like young adult pulp fantasy stuff, was um, oh my god, what's his name? Uh, he did Valus. He did oh, Dwayne Dwayne's Dwayne Electric Sheep. Philip, Philip K. Dick. K. Dick. Yeah. How could I forget Philip K. Dick? Incredible. Love Dick. Incredible. I, his stories were some of the first things that introduced me to like that feeling of the really uncanny. You know, that feeling of like, whoa, what? And you get that creepy, strange sensation that stays with you for days afterward mm. that something isn't quite right. The way that I think a lot of really good science fiction does. Uh, the ideas and and the feelings that those ideas make you feel i found so powerful to be able to make someone else feel that would be incredible to be able to construct a set of ideas or like a premise that says what if and to get people's wheels turning what was the original question again james I think I've strayed right away you. from it. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. You're, 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 exactly. That that 
the, the, the way authors can make you feel so damn powerfully. Mm. And it doesn't have to be the feeling of strange. It can be feel, feel sad or uh, anything. Yeah. That, that inspires me to be able to do that. Um, yeah. I, when I don't read, I don't feel like writing. And when I read, I feel like this is completely contradicting what I was saying before. No, I do feel like writing sometimes it's after I've been reading. When you read a really good book, it makes you like, Oh, I want to do this. Do you yeah. guys get that? You're nodding. Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I yeah. get that exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. Even if I, I just come across that. like a structural thing in a story, I'm like, wow. So oh yeah. <laughs> right now yeah. in the mirror in the light, the, the Wolf Hall book I'm reading, I'm actually got a pencil that I keep next to my bed and I'm underlining passages and I'm putting like little brackets around paragraphs and dog earing everything because I want to come yeah. back to these moments that have made me go, holy yeah. shit, like that is really good. Yeah. And maybe try and reuse some of those techniques in my own. Yeah, absolutely. Writing. I do that all the time. We're like right, right. Authors I really, really like. I'll come back and I'll be like, this action scene was really good. Yeah. Why was this action scene really good? And I'll read back yeah. over the last few pages to be like, why did I care? Why did I care about the character? Why did I care about what yeah, was going okay. on? Yeah, okay. That's it. How did they structure the action scene? And like, I've noticed Dan Simmons writes incredibly good action what scenes. Is, what does Dan Simmons write? He wrote uh, Hyperion. He wrote The Terror. Uh, yeah. I've mentioned one about a, a couple vampires of times. as well. There's like a... Carrying you know. Comfort? Yes. That one is that is, that is steady. That's really good. It's a good name. Yeah. Every single one of his stories has a scene in it where some kind of cr- monster approaches a, a, a POV character and he describes the Brett as like carrion Brett, carrion scent. It is like in every single one of his stories. It's the Does same. He... he loves that concept of it's something, some kind of creature exhaling the smell of carrion. Does he know he's doing it, do you think? Or he must, like, it's so consistent. Okay. That's yeah. kind of funny. At this point, it's almost like an Easter egg, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's um, it's, it's a signature, yeah. 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 He he writes really good action, but I've noticed some of his larger action scenes follow the tree act structure and the find the hero's journey, where it's like the refusal, the call, and then there's the mentor moment, and then the character becomes active in the action scene. And they, they often break down into that. It is longer scenes. And I'm like, that's why that action scene was so compelling, because it was a little oh. story. In that's itself. crazy. That's nuts. Yeah. Which kind of feeds back into what, or something similar to what Ali was saying about fight scenes and wrestling, how they mm. follow the villain antagonist performance and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah we often yeah. think of action scenes as like a separate thing, but it's almost like a little story in itself. Yeah. I mean, I maybe remember... you could think about every scene like that. That's all. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. I'm done. Alex, yeah. 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 No, because that is probably very true. Yeah. Every argument and every conversation and every. Yeah. Maybe. Do. maybe one of the action scenes that always stands out in my mind is, as it, and it inspired like the first book I ever wrote pretty, pretty much single-handedly, I'd say, because I was just like, that's so cool, is um, the first maybe 50 pages of Snow Crash. Holy shit. That's like the greatest car chase ever written. You can find a better car chase written down in words. I will, I'll send you 50 bucks. Um yeah, book is it's called Snow Crash. It's called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. Um, it was, I think, the first thing he ever wrote. It basically it came up with the contra- concept of like, you know, the Matrix or some virtual world. It kind of invented that. It was one of the first things that did it. Um, but like, just the first, like, totally separate to that, like, just the first little bit where he's introducing the world and like the the idea that you know it's all totally zoned off into these um, uh, corporate like lots that are their own countries and like. This guy's a pizza delivery driver and he's like literally driving a pizza into one of these things. It's it's hilarious. You just, just the first 50 pages, like the rest of it's good. The rest of it is good and worth reading, but mm-hmm. that first 50 pages is just, it's like, yeah, one of my top action scenes thing ever. Um, so if you're looking for inspiration, really inspiration for action scenes, check that out for sure. Definitely. Yeah. James, what inspires you to write? Um, <laughs> I hate that I picked this. I, like, I'm the host, I picked this topic. Because <laughs> you have to answer them all as well. <laughs> yeah. I was praying. I was praying one or two people or else would show up. Um, nah, the, nah, man. Yeah, I mean, definitely the same as yourself, Paddy. When I come across something in a, either a film or another book that uh, I think is like a really good um, either plotting technique or like a st- structural thing in a story or something that makes me like like feel something, and I'm like, oh wow, that was a, that was mm. cool how they do that. That inspires me for sure. Um, as people and like people that you meet in life. Or like I read a lot of history. So when I come across stuff in history that like people have done, and I'm like, oh, 
God, that's fucked. And then I end up like processing that by writing a story about it. Yeah. Because there's something about putting myself into someone else's shoes and trying to think about it from their point of view that helps me process or helps me understand something. Um, yeah. But I almost have to write about that at the same time in order to kind of make sense of it. Um, so at some point I just started kind of structuring that into stories as well. Um, um, rather than just doing it as a process in and of itself, I kind of made a little story around it. Um, so that's where an, an awful lot of my stories come from. Um, just weird stuff I came across in history or weird interactions I had with people that I kind of like just got stuck in my head and had to sit down and write about it. And then it was like... Oh, I'll put a first act structure here and I'll put a bit of conflict here and some theme and then it turns into a story. That's that's a, that's one thing for sure. I also love zombie stuff. <laughs> I write so much about zombies. <laughs> um I, I love zombies as like just a thematic tool because they can represent anything. Um yeah. I feel like they're very versatile. What do you mean? Um, I actually don't know what you mean by that. So like I, I get that the zombies are always representing something bigger than they're not. It's the zombie movie is not about the zombies, right? Yeah. But when you say yeah, like anything, I like, can't. Zombies aren't that broad, right? Mm, I feel like, I feel like, like stretch it to be a lot. Like you could definitely get like let's say you've got a character and he's alone and everyone else is a zombie. It's just like your character feels alienated. Your character feels lonely. Yeah. Um, okay. A tool for right. if you're writing about a breakup, um, where you have. Maybe I have a story where two characters were living in a city and they were like kind of scavenging abandoned material from this like zombie city and selling it back to people who live outside the cities because no one lives in the cities because that's where the zombies are. And then one of the characters wakes up one morning and finds the other fellas fucked off and he's like, oh, he's left me. And they were like partners. He's like, he's just up and left me. And now I'm alone in this city full of zombies. And it's just like the concept mm. of like when the other person has left. And you don't feel connected to anyone else in yeah. the world, basically. So yeah, it's just kind okay. of taking that idea and making it much more dramatic. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like you can do do that with zombies at almost anything. They can represent, I'm sold. yeah, it's like yeah. A yeah. Magnification, <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. You can I'm use it to represent an emotional state of mind or like yeah. a uh, the socio political thing, or you know, George yeah. Romero is really good at that. Actually, a lot of like the the Day of the Dead or the Of the Dead stuff is is really good. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly with how, if you look at how everyone is consuming almost the same news stuff now at the moment, that's something that I'm noticing. When the news cycle hits, people tend to have like, only a few opinions. And then the news cycle is over and it's the next subject and everyone's kind of just regurgitating what they're hearing. It sort yeah. of just feels like everyone's a little bit of a zombie and no one's... No one has their own opinion anymore and no one's really reading into subjects. Everyone's sort of just repeating what's popping in their feeds. They're just repeating the sound bites. Yeah, parroting it off. So it's easy to feel like a zombie in, in modern technology society, is how I feel. <laughs> um yeah, so let's see. Hit us with the question hammer. Hey. Hit us with the question hammer. Let's go. What do you get? Oh. What do you get out of writing? Or what do you hope to get out of writing? And that's hmm. the, just the process of writing, not necessarily long-term, just the process of sitting down and doing it. Yeah, an incredible sense of accomplishment. Hmm. When you write something and you're actually proud of it and you look back, it, it feels great. Uh, I've never published anything, but actually, even if I never do, well, I know I have published something. What am I talking about? We've all published The New Mythic, a collection of sci-fi and fantasy available now on Amazon. Listener, if you're link looking below. to... Yeah, link below. Uh, it's yeah, you look back on what you've written, and if you're proud of it, it feels so good. I suppose, like any creative endeavor, um, to know that I've done this and I think it's great. I don't know it's it's like leaving a mark on the world that can be really, really hard to leave otherwise. Yeah, yeah. it's sort of like it's sort of like creating culture, I think, is in the in the greater the macro thing of it. Like, sure. you are you are part of this interwoven fabric that is the world and if you get really lucky uh, or you're really good at what you do or some combination of both you can have a chance to leave a pretty significant mark at least for a little bit um which is just a fascinating concept to me but i think on a um on a micro level on a day-to-day -day level it's just like yeah you just get a 
like I, I know I keep going back to this exercise metaphor. Um, it's just it's just a really easy way for me to process it, but it just feels like when you've completed a really like a good workout or something, you just feel satisfied. You're just like, oh, I, I did that. Like I I got that done. I don't have to I don't have to worry about doing that anymore today. It's almost like a sense of relief or like a a, a assuagement of anxiety. It's just like I oh, that's done. I don't have to worry about doing that anymore. I've I'm I've gotten through that. Whether it was good or it was bad, it's just it is complete. Uh, like I've done 500 words today and I feel pretty good about that. You know, I want to do more, nice. um, but at least there's that, you know, like, like the, the, the school mom in me can't go like, you didn't do any writing today. Cause I can be like, yes, I did. I wrote 500 words. Hmm. There's also something to just, it, it could be anything like studying a craft and perfecting a craft, you know, when you can feel yourself getting better, you feel yourself getting more proficient. Like that leveling up yeah. feeling is incredibly gratifying. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I don't, do I have any other creative endeavors? I don't know if I do, but writing is a, a wonderful one for that. What about yourself, James? Um, yeah, I, def- I guess the same, same as yourself. Like when I'm sitting down and I, if I'm editing kind of a big chunk of stuff, then I've gotten sure I'm like, yes, that, that feels like I've tightened that up so much. Um, I do love the feeling of, I don't know if either of you get this uh, or if I'm just a little bit up myself. <laughs> when you sit down and you read back over something you've written, particularly if you're reading through yeah. something you've read and you're yeah, like, oh, course. this is crap, this is crap, oh, this is crap. Good. And then you get something you're like, oh, I'm deadly. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. No, th- yeah, like, no, if, if you don't have that, you wouldn't want to keep writing, right? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Well, yeah. I, yeah. I think that's totally healthy like to be able to say oh, like yeah, okay. this is <laughs> well, isn't it i don't know maybe, maybe we've both got the pathology but like of course well, i like, think you should a, be able to be proud a, of what what you've done yeah. that's a yeah. potent point patty because i think a lot of people do like i do what I, they don't they okay. feel guilty at not no 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 they read back over their stuff and like this is the, i think this is the biggest problem any writer has and i feel really bad for anyone who has it because i personally don't experience it as much maybe i just have a lower bar for what i set myself but um if you like, there are people who read back over what they've written and just always go, Oh, it's crap. It's crap. And like, I don't think mm. that measurement is necessarily tied to reality. Always. Sometimes it can yeah. be. I think when you've done enough of it, you, you get a sense of like, yeah, you really, you know, are you really on your best work there? Probably not. But by that stage, you've got enough um, backlog behind you to be like, but I can write and it is fine. But I think a lot of people get sucked into that cycle of no matter how good it is objectively like if a thousand people read it and, and went back um which they don't because no, they, they're too afraid to show it to anyone mm-hmm. um they just think what they've written is crap and i think that's a real struggle for a lot of writers they're just irrespective of what it's objectively like if mm. you so you could say such a thing about writing they just read it back and go like this isn't very good and i think if that happens to you for long <clears> enough and you're not able to uh, effectively identify the good things in your writing and give yourself yeah. a pat on the back for that. I yeah. think it will cause a lot of people to quit because it's like, who wants to just do something they suck at or they think yeah. they suck at? I got a question for you guys. Let's say that you started writing and you started to show some people and quite a few people went, like, is it good, nigga? <laughs> and like, you get mm-hmm. the impression from people, your writing is actually not that great. Do you think you'd still write? Yeah, definitely. Like, I, I think that I've sent out enough feedback. I sent out enough stuff and, and gotten feedback um, that my attitude towards it is, if this is bad now, then I have, it's better that I figured it out so that I could make it better. The mm. idea for me is that I'm always trying to get better at the process. So mm. even if I'm not, even if I'm bad at it now, I can get better because I keep learning and I'm better than I was a year ago and I'm better than I was a year before that. Because you'd be writing either way, right? Yeah, I'd be doing it either way, so uh, I might as well keep trying to get better at it. I think it, it for me, it would depend if it was the first skill set I had acquired. Like the first thing I ever got really good at was learning guitar. Like I learned how to do that and I got to a point where I was like, I can I can do this now. I can play guitar. Mm-hmm. And that gave me the the meta skill set to to understand how to learn things. You know, and that was listening to a lot of things that that taught me how to do it as well. Um, so if I were to pick it up now and show people and be like, mm, is this is this really what you want to do? And I it was what I want to do. I'd go, okay, this is this is clearly not very good. But like James said, I have the capacity to improve because I have what's called a growth mindset. I'm like, this is here. Like, this might be bad, but I am not bad. So I can make this better. 
Mm. Um, if it was the first thing I'd done though, and people were consistently like, oh, Alex, I don't, I don't know if this is for you. I very well might have been like, okay, this is this is too hard. I don't I don't want to do this. So I think mm. it depends on where you are and your 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 emotional journey and development. You know. Yeah, I think um, an issue for me, not so much about the writing, but would be the stories and the kind of things I write about and the kind of stories I tell would be if I get enough feedback of like, James, no one wants to read this and no one's ever <laughs> going to want to read this, which could happen. That'd be the thing that would be like, oh no, <laughs> I've, yeah. wasted, I've wasted all this time getting really good at a craft to, it'd be like making music that is like, that's the kind of music I'm always going to make. But no one wants to hear this kind of music. Oh, that would yeah, bother me less. Kind of a, the subject huh? matter, because I'm kind of, really? of the, yeah, like if people told kind me of a tragedy. That, <laughs> if people told me that my writing wasn't any good consistently, I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing. Wow. Unfortunately, I, I don't get that. Yeah, because I don't know. There's other ways I could spend my time. Like life's not long yeah. enough. I could be doing a thousand things. But if people said, "Hey, the writing is really good," but no one wants to read about this. This this is insane. <laughs> What's wrong with you? I, I don't know. I think the internet's big enough to find your like weird little yeah. niche of whatever niche, that yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. you then yeah. you get really really big on that obscure subreddit. I don't think that would bother mm, me. Okay, yeah. you just never show your parents, but <laughs> all <laughs> yeah, the other exactly. weirdos in their basement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah just, like, I think I, I could something. live with that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you the master of your corner, your obscure corner. Yeah, is that what you meant, James? I don't actually know if that's what you. That, were that's what I meant. Yes, yeah, so it's the idea okay. of like James. These are these are just sad stories, and I'm not to read. What are you doing, mate? <laughs> Do nah, better. You, yeah, but there's an audience for everything. I think. Yeah. If <laughs> if if the base material is good, I don't know. Maybe not. But that's that's what well, I'd like to I, imagine. I, this is a bit of a this is a bit of a tangent for that, but I really like the idea of uh, just doing like really high quality like ghettoized stuff, like ghettoized really trashy stuff done really really well. Like that, okay, okay. that's what that's what um, uh, Philip Marlowe that uh, you know the detect the hardboard detective stuff. That's what that was like. That were these these little, little comics, basically these little trashy paperbacks that uh that people would read and just throw away and this guy was like i really like this stuff i'm going to write in this genre that is like critically yeah. panned and is yeah. just terrible and everything and now it's regarded as literature you know like he's it's a, like it's a penguin classic paperback you know yeah that idea really fascinates me like writing about something like it's like it comes back to the max you know like it's something really silly like giant robots but like th this is the whole idea I have of this the concept me and Patty can't seem to agree upon, which is called Big Dumb, which is about these yeah. really stupid things. But like in my in my interpretation of it, it's like that done to a really high level and just done like, bigly. Yeah, exactly. It's like Conan yeah. the Barbarian. It's it's silly, silly stuff, but it is done with such finesse and such love and care that you're almost like, wow, this is really good. You know, do you know what I mean? That yeah, I, yeah, I that's find a that idea. really I like that. There's a weird hopefulness to that that, that I like. To be yeah. honest, that's kind of how I consider all zombie media. I'm in theory yeah. not really into zombie stuff, but there's so damn much of it that, you know, the cream rises to the top and the cream is stuff like The Last of Us and is actually yeah, yeah. really good. Absolutely. Just, yeah, ra like raising ghettoized uh, material out of the ghetto and making it, you know, literarily appreciable. You know, it I don't stays know, in the ghetto, but it becomes a super ghetto. Yeah, exactly. It's a ghetto mm. where, like, I don't know, everyone has gold-plated Uzis. Or something. I don't fucking know. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, I, li I like that. I feel like each of these, yeah. The next question, I feel like we're almost covering it already. So, like, what do you want your writing to achieve artistically? Big pile of money. <laughs> okay, that's I, not... I, artistically slash professionally. <laughs> <laughs> that's not untrue, but to have people say like wow damn that that really affected me you know like even if i just made like a small additional side income with writing which frankly is like what i'm aiming for and anything else is a bonus to have like imagine someone coming up to you in like a bar or something or not even just like an online message and say like dude that that book or even that chapter of that book was amazing that really connected with me i really really felt something that would make it all worth it like artistically, if I can have something that affects people or the people remember or that stays with them, then that would be, yeah, 
that's that's the pinnacle right there yeah i'd say it is uh yeah it's sort of what i talked about there i i'd really like to merge i'm, I'm working on something right now which is sort of in the literary genre with a bit of horror into it there so like being able to combine those two things and have like a literary bent where it's like really focused on the tiny small things and the, the minutiae and the mundane things because whenever i read a, a book that's just like really classic there's just this almost this feeling of relief that comes over you it's like you feel like you're being nourished by the material so yeah. to be able to provide that feeling but then also with that like those creepy overtones of like something horrific is I, I don't know why i'm drawn to that but yeah like that but like patty said really just to make people feel something and connect with it and be like this is really cool i i'm really glad you have put this out into the world yeah yeah i definitely be the same um i love i love people that like empathize with my characters to like feel like they get what the characters are going through um and if i can put forward some kind of nugget of a question or nugget of an idea that makes someone think about the world a little bit differently or expands someone's uh, concept of of our world um i'd love that as well because that's something i've gotten a lot of out of books is kind of different perspectives and thinking yeah. about things differently like i've learned yeah. so much from all the literature i've read that i'd love to try to encapsulate some of that or pass on not necessarily things that I've learned, but then we pass on the nugget of a, a the seed of a question that has led me to, to figure something out to other people. I love that. Yeah. I had some throwaway quote recently. It's a shame I can't remember what it is, but it's something about fiction being like a, a really wonderful way of building empathy or, or something mm. like what is, what is the purpose of fiction? It's yeah. You mentioned before putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Yeah. Um, so powerful for that, which is kind of ironic because it's, not real you're showing people scenarios that aren't real and yet they're learning something real in the process about the real mm -hmm. world yeah i think it, i think it's often because people we, we all only have a certain well not the, we all have a certain amount of emotions so no, no matter what the situation someone's in yeah. they're going to be feeling the same emotions as you've probably felt at some other time in your life based on something that you went through yeah just mm -hmm. uh, you know yeah this person's in space fighting with laser swords um, but yeah. it's still it's still real human emotions that that's yeah. at, the, at the core of it that could be me in space fighting with laser mm -hmm. swords yeah <laughs> how would i feel if i lost my wizard granddad <laughs> pretty bad pretty yeah. bad <laughs> um on my hand then, <laughs> hey on my hand on my hand <laughs> yeah <laughs> damn that was my laser hand <laughs> that was my good hand <laughs> Oh, okay, so oh, this, this is my last question. So, in a in one sentence, um, what would you hope others say of your writing? I think I just hope they said it was really good. I think, like, I I don't think my my writing is particularly particularly um, flashy or uh, like beautifully crafted. I, I it's it's pretty it's pretty bare bones, which is fine because that's what that's just how I it's my voice. Um, but I think, I, yeah, I just like them to say, yeah, no, he's a really good writer. That's great. Like, I, I, I really liked that story. I think it's well written. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, think, man. yeah I've, I've never actually considered that. But, you know, it's probably like, this is super specific. And I don't know why this is like such a high bar for me. But like talking about Philip K. Dick. Like if someone, if I could write stuff that felt really uncanny and really made people like, I've never felt like that before. I've never thought mm -hmm. about something in that way before. That, that would be amazing. Yeah. Communicating some kind of idea or feeling that really, mm -hmm. really resonated with people, I guess, I guess, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I need more time to think about this. I didn't come prepared. James, yeah, sorry, that, was a, that was a tough one to try at the end. No, it's, it's, um, I, it's good. It's good. This is really <laughs> plumbing the depths. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd love people to say that it felt authentic or that it felt like yeah, okay. what the characters was going through felt real. Yeah, it Even felt real. The situation yeah. the characters were in was bananas. <laughs> Your answers are all making me realize that I just don't really give a shit about character that much. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, was, like, I want to write authentic characters and make people empathize. It's not interested in characters. What does that say about <laughs> me? I don't know. I mean, for what it's worth, I think you're like certainly in the parts of the novel that I've read of yours. Like, I think the characters are quite relatable and quite, I appreciate yeah, that. Like, yeah. so I don't think I don't think it's a a deficit in your skill set. So it's maybe cool. it's just I mean, that's, that's good to hear. Attention to. 
Yeah, you know, it's just like that's not that's not my focus, man. I mean, if well, the ideas, like, yeah, man. There's, there's different books and different. Yeah, with different things. If you fit together, different stories. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Isaac Asimov made a career of not not caring about authors. I mean, characters. So, or, yeah. or just not being very good at doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it, it so, definitely so wasn't his interest. He, he just became quite open about that towards yeah. the end. He was just like, yeah. "Hey, you're you're not here for the characters, so yeah. let's not waste yeah. time." And yeah, they're great so. books. They are great books. The yeah. Foundation series is one of my favorite sci-fi series of all time. It's mm. great, great series. So uh, that was the end of my questions, but I just wanted to leave it open mm. to you guys. If there's anything else you wanted to say out or ask yourselves, um, I think it's important for people to work out what writing means to them and why yeah. they are doing something and what sort of impact they would like to have. I mean, look, it's totally possible to just write because you like it and you're enjoying it. But for, for me, at least, it's good for me to understand where writing fits into my life and where I would like it to go. And that's something I've been clarifying hmm. recently. Um, and I don't think it's, it's made it any less significant. I think maybe it's made it more significant but getting some clarity on what it means and yeah, what I want to do with it uh, just makes it easier to understand what relationship I have to it every time I sit down at the keyboard. Wise words. Wise words. I like that. Thanks. Nothing to add. I got nothing. <laughs> well, said it all. Um, so we've got a few quotes to finish off this one because it didn't really yeah. make sense to read just one since. As mm. Alex said, writing means something different to everybody. Um, so I guess we might just take it in terms, jumping around and reading around a few of our favorite quotes. Um, I have this first one from Isabel Allende. I need to tell a story. It's an obsession. Each story is a seed inside me that starts to grow and grow like a tumor. And I have to deal with it sooner or later. Damn. I would love to <laughs> feel like that about writing. Mm. Uh, yeah, no, I, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm. I don't know how to pronounce this. I'm really sorry to you, Anais Nin. A n i a n a i s n i n. Anais Nin. We write to taste life twice in the moment and in retrospection. I love that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Cool. That's really good. I the one I'm going to do is by Lionel Shriver, who is the writer of um, We Need to Talk About Kevin, which is. Mm. probably the best book about school shootings i think anyone's ever written uh, mm. incredible incredible book uh, and she said in the big picture i write for an audience of people i've never met by the final draft i'm looking for anything in the prose that's prospectively boring to strangers i think that's just such a perfect like technical definition of how to write just write for for people you 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 know just for people you've never met to, to begin with um and then write at the end figure out what you don't like about it and get hmm. rid of that. Just, so she, so okay. she's saying that she identifies the things in her writing that she thinks would be boring to people that she's never met that maybe haven't even read yeah. the book and changed that. Yeah, I that's, guess, I guess so. that's, I really like that actually. Mm. Yeah. It seems really obvious, but it's very um, self, um, self-effacing, I think in a way, which is good. Like hum uh, humbling, I guess. Like mm. if someone yeah. picked this up and read it, what, what are they not going to care about? You know, mm. like, that's a cool, yeah, that's a cool perspective to get into. Um, I've got one more here. One of the most fundamental human fears is that our existence will go unnoticed. We'd all like to have it recorded somewhere. What better way to achieve this goal than by writing? Long after maggots have had their way with my corpse, my name will still be on the spines of books in the Library of Congress. I'm on record. That was by Ralph Keyes. That's good. Yeah. That's quite a nice one, yeah. Good way to close it's like up. the maggots and the corpse. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Is he a horror writer, a horror writer by any chance? <laughs> Actually, don't know who I don't know. So what he writes. Well, I wrapped up. <laughs> yeah. Close it out. Close it out. Thank you very much, listeners, for joining us on our discussion on why we write. Um, this has been the Pros and Cons podcast. And you do us a great favor if you could leave us a review on your streaming service that you listen to this on mm -hmm. and let us know what you thought of the podcast and if you liked it. And even leave a comment on our YouTube channel on why you write or why you, uh, why you read. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye-bye.
You're listening to Pros and Cons, the Presbyterian Fiction Podcast. <laughs> 